So as advertised, this is our last day of talking about the hydrosphere. And we're gonna talk about um, water treatment and the kind of three topics today relate to waste water. The first one will be wastewater recycling and water reuse. And then we'll talk about a little bit more about disinfection and then we'll talk about um, wastewater treatment. So these are just some pictures of uh, water treatment plants. Um, and a reminder to please finish up chapter seven. So um, the first topic of recycled water this is becoming more and more important as more and more municipalities are kind of reusing water um, and more individual homeowners or renters or whatever are becoming empowered with technologies to sort of reuse their own water on site. And, but that, and that's one kind of water reuse. I just kind of want to emphasize that um, water reuse reclaims water from a whole bunch of different sources and treats it and uses it for a variety of purposes. And those can be kind of many and varied. They don't have to just be drinking water. Um, and you know, it provides alternates to existing water supply, which um, as climate changes and other things um, become less stable moving into the future, you can imagine that being able to reuse water either locally or regionally or even in a municipality provides some kind of water security. So um, <clears throat> this can happen in a both incidental way and in a planned way. So unplanned ways are, for instance, when a substantial fraction of the water that's used by, <clears throat> for instance, a city um, is already recycled. This output water from another source. So that other source needs to have it be clean enough that when it's released back into the environment, the next source or the next user down the line doesn't get, um, you know, contaminated water. And so, you know, given examples of the Colorado and the Mississippi River, there are lots of municipalities that pull water out of those rivers and then release it back into the environment so that downstream um, communities can also use that water. Some of that water is treated, and to some extent, there's also the reliance on dilution, right? If you put out water that's only mildly contaminated, if it dilutes with water that isn't contaminated, then it can still be acceptable um, for input water, at least water treatment. There's also planned water reuse, which is becoming more and more uh, common, and we'll talk about some examples here in Hawaii in a second. But this can be all sorts of different things. So reuse of water for agriculture and landscape, you know, watering golf courses, irrigation, industrial process water. None of these require the same level of cleanliness as drinking water. There are drinking water supply management and even groundwater supply management. So in some places where aquifers are being pulled down, water will be put back in to help sort of repressurize um, and that water needs to at least be pure enough or clean enough that when it finally manages to mix back into where water is being sampled, it's either naturally been cleaned or attenuated or what have you, um, so that it doesn't contaminate the, the new water. So these are just some examples of kinds of planned use of water. This is just a flow chart um, from the San Francisco Bay Area that some of the municipalities use where they have their water, they distribute it to a bunch of different uh, stakeholders, then you know they create wastewater and it goes through various forms of treatment. And we'll talk about what these treatments mean, but it has to go through something called tertiary treatment, which is way beyond what most uh, waste normal wastewater treatment is to make the water be useful for in any sense for recycled water. It's probably not even yet able to be drank. It's not, not good enough for drinking water, but it's good enough for agriculture and sort of watering parks and so forth. So this is kind of a list, you know, irrigation um, for agriculture and landscaping, um, landscaping around, around highways, for instance, uh, municipal water supply in some cases, process water for power plants, refineries, mills, factories. This is the kind of input water I mentioned last time when I talked about, um, you know, places that, uh, they don't need to be as clean as drinking water, um, industrial water. Indoor uses such as toilet flushing, if you imagine that you had houses piped in such a way that the toilet system was separate from everything else, then you could use um, gray water for that um, to some extent. There's a certain amount of variation of that water during every flushing cycle, so you have to be a little bit careful. But you know, there's that, 
there's certainly, you know, the amount of water that gets sprayed at construction sites for dust control, uh, making of concrete and other construction processes, supplying artificial lakes and inland coastal aquifers, environmental restoration, which is essentially these kinds of things, um, you know, irrigation water. So there's a lot of different uses and that water quality requirements for each of those are a little bit different. So this is just another a flow chart. This is from the EPA. Um, and you can read the article about it, but it basically shows you, yep, there's, you know, there's groundwater that gets treated for drinking water and distributed into cities um, and used that way. But there's also water that gets um, applied to the landscape or used in buildings, um, including runoff during, during storms. Like here, our runoff water and our sewage water is meant to be separate, but during heavy rain events, they, they co-mingle. You can't really... Uh, treat the water the same, but in a lot of places where it isn't quite as rainy, they keep the storm water separate, and that stuff requires a lot less cleaning than traditional wastewater. And you know, th through all of these various um, you know uses, the water will have different qualities, and some or all of it can be reused, can be repurposed for you know additional usage with some amount of cleaning. We'll talk about that amount of cleaning next. This doesn't try to distinguish all the possible uh, uses and requirements, but as you can imagine, irrigation water and agricultural water may not need the same requirements as, for instance, drinking water or even processed water that's going into um, industrial uses. So these are the kind of three categories that most of the industry uses for recycled water. That's what they call R1, R2, and R3, with kind of um, R1 being the most clean and R3 being the least clean. So R1 means that all the sort of you know, viral pathogens, any kind of bacterial pathogens are significantly reduced. And so the water needs to be monitored for you know, specific viral load for fecal coliform bacteria, and then also uh, density and TDS. And this is still not good enough for drinking water. Just think about all the other stuff that could be in there, chemicals, for instance, that would need to be removed. But this is like the primary consideration is to make sure that bacterially speaking, it's disinfected. Um, there's also um, R2 water, which gets oxidized so the reduced chemicals are removed and it's disinfected to meet certain bacteria and TS requirements. And this is the kind of water that might, for instance, be used in agriculture. Uh, you don't want to put you know, water with pathogens into um, uh, a field. Sometimes you hear about this, like, you know, there'll be a listeria or whatever outbreak in lettuce from California because some wastewater got into the water system. And when you apply that to the uh, field, some of that can get onto the plants. And so um, you always have to disinfect water pretty much. Um, there's this R3 water, which is really, you know, not very treated. It takes secondary um, recycled water, which we'll talk about um, what secondary treated water is in a second. And, and so, um, and cleans it a little bit more with a little bit more oxidation, aeration, basically. And this might be useful in some settings that are, that people are not going to really encounter the water very much, but it's not a very common uh, reuse of wastewater because the water is not really clean. So this level of cleaning is more common and this, R1, usually has levels on top of it that make it uh, potable, for instance, if you want. So for instance, you might consider, well, how is wastewater reduced in Hawaii? And this is from the, you know, DOH, the Hawaii DOH, and you can read about their sort of policy and so forth as of um, last year. And, you know, you can, and these are just some examples of like, yep, this is recycled water, so it says don't drink, um, as is this. And you know stuff like irrigation, as we mentioned, and, and boiler feed water for industry, and cooling tower makeup water. This is for air conditioning systems. The toilet flushings and some new developments, for instance, are the kinds of things where the water can be reused. And this is um, for the entire state. The sort of amount of those three categories: R1, R2, and R3. And you see that that R3 is pretty pretty small. It, you know it's roughly 50-50 R1 and R2 as kind of compatible with that list on the last slide. This is kind of the breakdown by, by island. And so you'll see that 
there's a lot more wastewater that's reused on Oahu than any of the other islands, um, even when you account for the difference in population. But um, this is the, the amount that I should say, this is the amount that's produced, that's the amount that's reused. And so um, they produce a certain amount, but some, but um, there's still not um, full community acceptance of using recycled water. So this is the amount of the available it's actually used. And so it's only on this island, it's only 11%. On Hawaii, it's a lot, it's a lot higher percentage of the total. That means that, that most of this recycled water is just going back out, uh, out to sea. It's just being discharged because it's not being used. Part of that is community acceptance. Part of that is not having the infrastructure to deal with the relatively large volumes of wastewater that is produced. And a lot of the water that's, that's not being um, used is basically left at the R3 level. There's no point cleaning it any further than that. It's just going to be um, released into the environment. And R3 is one step above what the EPA requires for release of wastewater, which is um, <clears throat> what we call secondary treatment or advanced secondary treatment. So there's a, there's a plenty of headroom here if we wanted to do more. This is the um, amount that's actually reused, um, you know, or actually produced, I guess I should say, by island, not the fraction that's, that's reused. So Oahu actually, um, you know, produces a fair amount, but as you saw from the last slide, the amount that actually gets reused is small. So being the most populous island, it would make sense to start reusing more of that and leaving the um, natural resource um, less perturbed as possible. This is um, the sort of percent of wastewater that's reused and unreused. And so you can see that there's there's a lot here that could be utilized. Not all of this is suitable for use. Some of this really very dirty, but um, plenty more could be reused here. And this is, again, this is from the state DOH, sort of their perception of what they think is the kind of reason why they haven't gone into reuse even more is, you know, sort of public perception. And then remember, uh, we talked about these last time, these contaminants of emerging concern, especially the pharmaceuticals and personal care products, such as, you know, here they list mouthwash, household cleaners, caffeine, Viagra, the list goes on and on. And the problem is, is that we don't, actually have any kind of acceptable methods for reducing these in water supplies. The chemicals are there. They're very, many of them are persistent, very hard to remove. They can be removed, but at considerable expense, um, and granulated activated charcoal is usually a part of that process. One thing that can be done to lower the concentrations but not remove these chemicals is, to, is by dilution, right? So if you've got pretty pure R3 water that's been cleaned up for, um, you know, to, to be drinking at drinking water standards, except for some of these kinds of contaminants, you can just mix it in with your other water, you know, dilute it by whatever, 20%, 30%, 40%, 50%, whatever is required. And so what it does is just extend the um, potable water supply by sort of bleeding it in, but you'll still have some of this present. And that's, that is a concern. And, you know, there's also this sort of, sort of cost considerations and regulatory considerations, which I think are probably um, secondary, in my opinion. I mean, yes, there are obviously are regulations and regulations regarding everything um, that water uh, being supplied to communities um, has to abide by. And, and costs, um, we can think about costs in a lot of different ways, but there are a lot of costs that people have sort of built into the concept of taking water out of the landscape, having you know streams that run dry, not having waterways that run all the way to the ocean uh, on most of the island, for instance. That that um, if you if you include those costs, then reusing water and restoring some of those things doesn't seem as expensive. So this is just uh, an infographic, um, you know, from a company that makes kind of personal water treatment plants, if you want to call it that, but it's something that can be put in an individual home where, um, and we'll talk, when we talk about what wastewater treatment next, we'll talk about what each of these stages do, but basically you're removing solids in some kind of um, process that separates the liquid from the solids. Uh, some of these solids are going to ha have to be uh, removed periodically, 
uh, by pumping, for instance, like in a septic tank. Uh, there's a natural biological breakdown which attenuates the DOC and some of the POC, and we'll talk about this a lot in a moment. These are what are called sludge reactors. Sometimes they're run in aerobic conditions, sometimes they're run in anaerobic conditions, sometimes you'll have one or the other uh, in sequence, and then sort of continued um, filtration, and this includes not just physical filtration, but chemical filtration, such as granulated activated charcoal, and then storage of water and reuse. And so, you know, this is conceptually set up to sort of monitor the water quality and be able to have a, um, a house be almost like a, a fixed loop, like the space station, right? Like there's like a certain amount of water and they recycle it all. Uh, whereas, you know, it's obvious that some certain amount of water may not, you know, really be reused. So, you know, there's a kind of point that you can have a top off, meaning collect off of off your roof into a rain barrel. But, but in theory, you could be completely off um, municipal water supply with a system like this, presuming that the system is always operating, that it's relatively easy to maintain, and that, it, that there's good monitoring, so you're not getting, you know, contaminated. So that's kind of um, recycled water. I just wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about it because it's becoming more and more prominent. So the next topic is um, water disinfection. So water disinfection, I mentioned it last time too, but we'll talk about it a little bit more this time. It works for both input water and output water, different requirements and different needs, but um, there are various chemical ways and physical ways to you know, disinfect water so it doesn't have any more pathogenic organisms. And this is just like another version of the diagram I showed you last time. That diagram showed you um, just uh, typhoid fever. This is the rate of all infectious diseases uh, in the country, you know, starting from the year 1900, going to the year 2000. And um, this comes from the CDC. And, you know, with some various milestones on here. If you recall, I mentioned last time that the sort of first kind of wide scale municipal water treatment was put in place in like 1908. And by sort of like 1910 or so, it was common everywhere. And so not all uh, um, infectious diseases have been eradicated by water treatment. Things like, you know, influenza pandemic, obviously, COVID pandemic that we just had. Um, and various vaccines have been introduced that have kind of, you know, pushed down rates of death from all sorts of um, bacterial and viral pathogens. But the lion's share of this curve is from water treatment, water disinfection. Now, there's some, you know, stats here about how, for instance, in the year 1900, there was something like 100 cases per 100,000 in the population of just typhoid fever alone. And by 1920, it had cut into about a third, and um, by 2006, it reached 0.1, you know, out of um, 100,000. So that's like a factor of a thousand from 100 down to 0.1. It's been important, and um, as I said last time, there's no doubt that you know most people would prefer to drink water that's been disinfected than not. But we'll talk now about what the disinfectants are and why some of them are not all that great for um, um, you know, treatment of water because of secondary pathogens that are contaminants that are produced in the water. So this is just another you know, pie chart sort of showing you um, all of the different causes of waterborne disease in the US um, just in the decade of 91 to 2000, right? So Paris, th th these are all biological, these three viruses, bacteria, protozoa, so that's, you know, approximately half. There's something like 40% that they don't really know what caused the outbreak. Um, and then, you know, something like 15, 16% chemical, meaning things like lead in the water or what have you. So you can see that of the ones that have been determined, the lion's share are biological, and this is why disinfection, which will treat all of those, is so important. And this is just like another interesting kind of infographic showing you the relationship between the percent of the population that has access to safe drinking water, and that includes disinfection plus removal of major contaminants, and plotted again over here is sort of death rate per um, whatever, uh, uh, for kids under five years of age in deaths per thousand. There isn't a direct one-to-one -one correlation, but it's pretty close. 
right? You can see that when you come down here, when the sort of these countries with 100%, they have very, very low um, death rates. Water purification is part of childhood mortality. It's obviously not complete. Like you can see countries like Pakistan, which have really relatively high percentages in both categories. That's, that's an anomaly. That's kind of more because of sectarian strife and so forth in that country. Um, but, and it's just important to note that especially, you know, for these countries at the top of the list over here in death rate, where so many of the people don't have access to clean drinking water, that adding that access could improve these numbers dramatically. Some of the ones down here, maybe not so much because there's other factors. Okay, so this is a typical um, set. These are, you know, five different possible ways in which disinfectant can be added to water here. I would consider where it says CL2 to just be, um, that is the disinfectant. We'll talk in a second about each of these chemicals. Chlorine gas was the original disinfectant used. It's not used very often anymore in most parts of the world. Um, and we'll talk about that in a, in a moment. But so just consider this as disinfection. So, you know, as a minimum level of treatment, you just disinfect the water and don't do anything else. Or maybe you disinfect and you physically filter. Uh, maybe you disinfect and you flocculate and you filter, disinfect, um, add some, so here the coagulant is added and then the sort of, you, you're presuming that you're collecting the solids during the filtration process. Here you added an extra flocculation step and, um, you know, perhaps even secondary disinfection, depending on what the water has. Uh, here's the sort of, you know, most um, complete treatment disinfection, coagulation, flocculation, sedimentation. That's if you've got producing a lot of solids that would clog the filter, put it into a settling pond and let a lot of the, the major fractions settle out. Then you filter, then you disinfect again. And as it says here, this is kind of the conventional treatment. So this is what a lot of wastewater will go through before it's released into the environment. Um, perhaps with only one or, or the other of these, when it's wastewater, when it's drinking water, this is a pretty standard um, process for disinfection. So that, you know, all, this, this is only the disinfection stage, right? It's not all the other stuff we talked about last time, but um, this is put near the end of that process so that presumably all, most of the other stuff is already removed. So <clears throat> when disinfection was first introduced, it was pretty much chlorine gas. Pretty inexpensive to make and produce. Um, you know, it's a gas. It's very toxic for um, breathing in. And what it does is it, you know, it dissolves in water. It's chlorine in the zero valence stage. And we know that mostly chlorine that we find in nature is Cl minus anion. So obviously it has to, um, <clears throat> whatever, lose an electron and become oxidized. And so what it does is it, it can help significantly oxidize um, cellular matter, membranes, for instance. So it's a pretty quick um, method, but like I say, it's, it's for, for primarily safety reason, but and secondarily because of the chemicals that are produced, it's not really used anymore. Instead, we use hypochlorous acid anion, which is basically bleach, right? Uh, it, do, it goes in in the anion form, which is similar to bleach. If you touch household bleach, chlorine bleach, and you put it in your hands, it's Kind of slippery because it's basic, you know, pH uh, nine and a half or ten, depending on how diluted it is on water, and it can usually be made on site uh, in a couple of ways. Putting chlorine gas into water and letting it sit for a while, it will dissolve and make that, um, or you can directly add this uh, calcium salt. One of the things about chlorination with this process is is that even more so than with this process, is safer, right? You don't have the gas, or, or if you're using the gas, you're using it in a contained way, um, but you make even more low molecular weight um, chlorohydrocarbons. So these are chlorinated hydrocarbons, like if there was methane in the water or ethane in the water or ethanol, uh, you chlorinate them. And these are pretty persistent and hard contaminants to remove once they've been produced, and they are, um, many of these are carcinogens. So ideally you wouldn't um, use them, you wouldn't make them. And so um, <clears throat> this is kind of just a comparison of the ClO2 method and the chlorine 2 method in terms of disinfection. You get a lot more 
disinfection um, process out of, out of chlorine oxide than you do out of chlorine. Um, but you also do make a lot more of these halogen hydrides. So one of the other things that's interesting about um, OCL is that OCL minus is that it reacts with ammonia uh, or nitrogen bearing compounds, including amines. And so what happens is that um, you add that stuff. And the first thing that happens is it reacts with the ammonia. And uh, you can see here you know, the amount of chlorine is added and the sort of amount of chlorine that's available for disinfection. But for a, a long part of time, you don't really gain any chlorine. You have to kind of reach what's called this break point, where then when you add the chlorine, it increases. And that's when you uh, already reacted with all the ammonia that's present to make um, <clears throat> you know, uh, chlorinated amine compounds, plus all of the organic carbon, so trihalomethanes, monochlorine, chloroamine. Um, these, are, these are just hydrochlorine hydrocarbons, and that's a chlorinated uh, nitrogen-bearing hydrocarbon, all this stuff. And so um, you know, basically, you put in something like five times as much chlorine as there is nitrogen in the water to then hope to get to this part of the curve. So depending on what the water has in it, if it's especially got a lot of nitrogen, this becomes really important in water reuse where um, there can be a fair amount of nitrogen in the water. You're gonna have to use a lot of chlorine to reach this point. So this is one of the reasons why wastewater um, is oftentimes treated to try and remove as much nitrogen as possible before disinfection. There's various biological ways to get the nitrogen out. We'll talk about them in a few moments. So, um, you know, the chlorine oxide as a gas is another thing that can be added instead of OCL minus. It's um, pretty much the same in terms of what it does to the, to the water. Um, but it's a really very reactive gas. So it's, it's not very common to use. Um, and it's not clear that there's, there's much benefit to ClO2 directly relative to OCL minus. Um, they're pretty much all, all of the various chlorine bearing ways of disinfecting water have the same drawbacks, which is the chlorination of nitrogen and the chlorination of hydrocarbons. So this is a, um, chart showing you kind of all of the ways that are currently available commonly for disinfection with those three that we just talked about being listed down here and then two others, ozone, ozonation, and ultraviolet light. And with a bunch of different parameters, and this comes from a, you know, an industry website. So you can, you know, take some of this perhaps with a grain of salt, but, but it's um, obviously plus is a positive, minus is a negative double minus is really negative, double plus is positive. And you can see that both ozone and UV don't have any of the negative drawbacks of any of the chlorination, right? So uh, no chemical byproducts, relatively effective. The costs, um, you know, plus minus is definitely more expensive, um, both in terms of initial setup. Um, operational costs, not as much, especially if you're talking about ultraviolet light. And, um, you know, the sort of um, production or what, whatever, things sticking to surfaces or things being left behind in the water are both um, considered positives, not for, for those. These are the main um, drawbacks of, of chlorine. It's, you know, not friendly to the environment and produces these chemical byproducts. So I, I just thought I would talk briefly about these two methods. Um, Ozonation, this is a picture from your text in a prior version when this was chapter eight instead of chapter seven, sort of showing you how you do this. You basically just take um, atmospheric oxygen and expose it to really high voltage and you produce ozone. Small amounts of ozone are produced in other ways too. Like uh, if you stand in a photocopier long enough, you'll breathe in a small amount of, um, of ozone that's a byproduct of that process. But basically you're taking compressed air, you're cooling it, you're drying it, and then you're exposing it to electricity. And this can be used in on-demand systems. I've seen people who have these in their homes in Mexico, for instance. And basically the ozone is sort of bubbled through water 
And then you let the water sit and it goes when it fuses away and it's disinfected. And I've drank that water and it's been fun. Um, but probably the gold standard, that, that's kind of expensive, is expensive equipment to maintain is um, ultraviolet light, ultraviolet disinfection. And this kind of shows you the wavelengths of ultraviolet light and really you want UVC, um, which is, you know, um, the shortest wavelengths of the three ultraviolets, A, B, and C. Um, that's that's the one that's largely filtered out um, by our ozone layer, so we don't see much UVC here on the surface of the Earth. But that's the kind of light you want to be able to kill uh, pathogens in the water. And so basically, water goes through. You know, we'll, I'll show you some configurations in a second. But goes through a source of light in this um, ultraviolet wavelength, pass it through slowly enough that it's disinfected. This is sort of a comparison of this UV to kind of chlorination and ozonation. And, you know, the sort of main benefits of this one are, you know, low operating costs and ease of maintenance compared to ozonation. And this is just some pictures of what it looks like, you know, what it can look like. This is water flowing through an array of tubes that are emitting ultraviolet light in a couple of different uh, cases. And these here, the, it's a little bit hard to see, but the lights are arranged vertically. The water's flowing through at a rate, it's monitored, of course, at a rate that allows, um, allows that to happen. So that's kind of disinfection. Now the last topic is wastewater treatment. So um, wastewater treatment includes kind of two components, it includes the water and the solids that are removed, which we call sludge. And wastewater can be treated to different levels, primary, secondary, and tertiary. And tertiary treatment is what moves you into the category of the R1, R2, and R3 that we talked about at the beginning to recycled water. So primary and secondary treatment, even something called advanced secondary treatment, is not enough to make the water um, suitable for any human uses, um, let alone drinking. But um, so this is a plot sort of showing you um, sort of, you know, throughout the United States, um, the relative amount of primary, secondary, and tertiary treatment um, sort of, you know, projected into the future as um, you know, the primary treatment not changing very much. The actual um, laws in the country are that once your city has um, a population of 100,000, you, you can't use primary treatment. It has to have at least secondary treatment. And so um, and there are, this is basically small, smaller towns that get away with just primary treatment. And primary treatment basically just remove the sediments, remove the suspended solids, things like grease. Uh, it, sometimes flocculants are added to promote solid formation and colloidal suspension, but that's it. It's just removing solids. Uh, secondary treatment will remove organic matter and reduce the BOD, which includes not only the DOC and POC, but also the organic nitrogen and organic phosphorus, which can contribute to BOD as we've talked about during the semester, plus these things, obviously. And so you can see here the uh, <clears throat> relative proportion of secondary treatment, you know, thought to and maybe me going to increase a little bit um, over this time period. And that the biggest advances are in this tertiary treatment. But at this stage, in, the, in this country at least, we're pretty much set in a set in stone sort of the relative amount of primary, secondary, and perhaps tertiary, um, or maybe that will continue to grow. This wasn't always the case. All through the sort of 70s, 80s, even into the 90s, there were a lot of municipalities, Honolulu being one of them, that refused to go into secondary treatment. They kept wanting to do primary, even when the population was a million, um, and there was wastewater spills and lawsuits. And um, I mean, ultimately, it's a little bit ironic because the amount of money they spent trying to, you know, on lawyers and so forth to continue with primary treatment, which really does contaminate the environment when you release this wastewater back into the environment, did not go to secondary, uh, was more than the cost that would have required to just finally 
switch from primary to secondary, which they ended up doing. It is now a secondary wastewater treatment city. Um, so this is just sort of a summary of what happens in wastewater treatment. And um, pretty much all output water in secondary treatment is disinfected, relatively low in VOD and nutrients, free of known toxins, right? So, and that's obviously specific to the water that's coming out and uh, what's in it and so forth. And other specifics that depend on how clean the wastewater needs to be is where it's going to go after. Like, is it going to be released into the ocean as here and in a lot of coastal cities and, um, where it can be a little bit dirtier than if the water is like, let's say you're inland and you're releasing your water, that water gets back into the hydrologic cycle and can show up downstream. Um, contaminants can show up in the downstream places as well. So there's also, you know, depending on how the water will be reused, you know, where it's released and how it's reused will depend, you know, to some extent on how the water needs to be cleaned. So this is kind of the basic steps. It's a flow chart, just like we looked at last time, where there's, you know, this is the screening for, for large uh, solids, oil and grit removal. So if there's organics that are in there, um, a sedimentation basin, which removes these particles that we call sludge, aeration, which helps oxidize things, um, clarifiers, which are basically tanks that help promote uh, flocculation and more solids removal. And then here's our disinfection, and then some process to remove the disinfectant, depending on what was used, and then our effluent. And this effluent, um, you know, needs to have, as it shows here, less than 30 milligrams per liter of, of BMT. And then that water will be discharged into the environment. This is um, assuming there's no other specific known toxins in the water that also need to be removed. So you can add other steps onto that. So here's some um, water reuse um, scenarios, if you want to call them that, that basically take that secondary affluent that we just saw in the last diagram and make it available as reuse water, meaning R1 water in this case. It gets additional filtration, additional purification by reverse osmosis that we talked about and then it goes to customers. So this has been disinfected. It has relatively low BOD. It doesn't have any um, consideration of dissolved contaminants like the personal care products, for instance. So this is this is water for industry, you know, boilers, uh, air conditioning, that kind of stuff. But this is not, not drinking water, but um, still a lot of water is consumed that way. This is another <clears throat> scenario. And in this case is making irrigation water. So the skin, that secondary affluent is, um, you know, experiences more particulate removal, flocculation, filtration, disinfection, better disinfection using ultraviolet in this particular case instead of chlorine. And then this goes again to R1 customers. And this is, this is the irrigation again. It's not drinking. We don't have specific contaminants being removed, but it's another, you know, kind of, of, of water. So um, this is just a slide sort of summarizing the history of secondary water treatment in the United States, uh, which really only came online as a requirement in the mid eighties. And so it's kind of funny that the two places that I've lived, both of them, you know, Honolulu here for 30 years in San Diego before that were places that tried not to do um, secondary. Now, when we look back on this, whatever, you know, 40, 45 years, um, it, from the future, it seems absolutely ridiculous. It, it seemed ridiculous though at the time that the amount of money that was being spent on lawyers and fines due to um, wastewater discharge events of basically just advanced primary effluents, which is basically just solids removal. There was no consideration of BOD. So there are algal blooms, coastal ocean happening all the time. Um, it's, it's, I don't know. It's kind of crazy, but but this isn't the only way that wastewater that hasn't been fully treated gets released into the environment. You can also have sort of accidental release from leaky wastewater transfer pipes. So you may remember we had our forced main water break here in uh, underneath the Alawai Canal that spilled tons of raw sewage into the Alawai and into the um, 
the boat harbor, I forget what it's called, the yacht harbor kind of by the Hilton, and then all along Waikiki Beach, there were uh, at least one person for sure died from going in the water, but perhaps as many as three people died. And um, so <clears throat> this kind of stuff happens. And, you know, it, it kind of emphasizes that wastewater is pretty nasty stuff. And even if you have a city that's treating the water properly, how it handles the water before it gets to the treatment plant is also important. There's also accidents that happen in sewage treatment plants. For here, for instance, um, during heavy rain events, um, the treatment plants can become overwhelmed. They can have releases, and this happens. That's one of the questions that you see on your on your midterm exam is one of these that happened on Big Island. Um, and so there are lots of ways that untreated wastewater can, can get into the environment. <clears throat> this is just, excuse me, um, some examples of some of the stuff that happens from the discharge of incompletely treated wastewater. So this is high BOD, just biological oxygen demand. These are concentrations in sort of wastewater um, outflow. Uh, this is south of, of um, New York City. So kind of like Atlantic City and that kind of stuff. Um, their wastewater discharge. This is the Hudson River Canyon kind of coming through in the continental shelf. These are um, that bathymetry lines, 50 meters, 100 meters. And you can see that you know, this sewage outfall there's basically zero concentration of oxygen. It's completely anoxic. If you recall, when we talked about um, hypoxia and eutrophic, that basically anything is less than a quarter of saturation, or specifically, is that's eutrophic, and uh, hypoxic is anything less than two, is a large area. And so this isn't all from this one particular outfall. This is a New York City outfall, too. But in, in this particular outfall, uh, because of the way the water was being distributed to the environment, there was a zone, pretty large zone, where it's completely anoxic. And then this you know, very large area, 100 miles longer so, where the concentrations are below one or even below two. And it's, you know, it's really not acceptable. And this, is, um, this was sort of in the 70s before um, primary, I mean, excuse me, before secondary um, contaminant removal, lowering the DOD was put into place. So those are the kinds of observations. It's not restricted to just there. You can see essentially the same thing off the coast of Southern California. So this is some other contaminants. Even if you lower the BOD, it doesn't mean you're necessarily lowering all of the other contaminants in the discharge. This is the same basic area, but kind of zoomed in. We're looking kind of now up, up in sort of this corner, you'll see that that feature in these diagrams. There's just some other things. Um, you can see some of the places where wastewater is deposited, where sewage sludge was deposited in the ocean, um, and dredge spoils. This is stuff that comes out of harbors. And you can see the concentrations of you know copper, lead, and organic carbon. Again, in some cases, reaching up to 20% by mass of the surface sediments. And, you know, think as we've talked about before about the salting off process where you have organic matter that's releasing in the environment. If it's holding heavy metals, like chelation, it will release some of those metals into the water. And so, uh, and then obviously the water goes down by density, flows through that shelf, uh, this valley, the uh, Hudson Valley notch in the shelf and distributes into the environment. And so, um, <clears throat> There's all sorts of legacies of wastewater discharge that, um, you know, in the, in the ideal, more attention would be spent to all the contaminants, not just the DOD, because that other stuff is still pretty much going on. And this is just an example from uh, Los Angeles. This is sort of, you know, LA and the uh, rivers that flow in um, and sort of this area of Santa Monica Bay, there, there's a, um, you know, current that flows along the California coast that before, when you're north of Santa Barbara, when the coast is kind of more east-west, it flows really strongly. And then you get into that part where, where California kind of takes that big bend and it's got all the islands, the offshore islands. And so the current becomes a lot less strong, a lot less upwelling, and the water be can become a lot dirtier. And so this is a, this is a large city, second largest in um in the country, and there's a lot of discharge, and this is actually a really shallow bay. 
so that you know the island could stick out uh, there, sort of out in this area. And here, during the ice age, this this was pretty much all exposed land. Very little of it is deeper than about 100 meters or so. And so, putting in the um, outflows has caused really significant um, damage. You know, in the in the form of algal blooms and benthic um, anoxia and so forth. Long term, this affected sort of fisheries and other things. You can see the places where the outflows are. And this is things that they've been trying to improve over time, but um, probably not as fast as they should. And this is just an example of how putting in high BOD, even if it's not so high that it makes the water go anoxic, but if it puts it into a condition, you know, even if we're above hypoxic, let's say there's three milligrams per liter of oxygen, uh, you can still change the uh, consortium of organisms that live in those environments. So this just happens to be an example of, you know, the numbers of, of these are numbers of individuals of these two species. One of them, sort of a normal background species, and another one is, <clears throat> excuse me, ones that are found, you know, in environments where um, it's sort of degraded, um, you know, more sediment and more organic matter, basically. And sort of when you go right at where the sewage outfall is, you'll see kind of one species go down in concentration and the other one go way up. And this is, um, you know, at levels that are considered acceptable uh, discharge, but you're still changing population dynamics. And you can imagine that this extends out to all sorts of other types of organisms besides bivalves. So there are some things that can be done with wastewater discharge that help minimize some of these negative impacts, <clears throat> even if the water is treated to a certain level, um, it can be distributed in the environment where it's discharged through a diffuser or discharged over you know, some long distance. There's a pipe and the little bits of water are leaking out over a kilometer or something. That helps dilute the effluent and it helps um, you know, um, kind of minimize a lot of these impacts. You still get a distributed um, Kind of reduction in the oxygen quality in the water and uh, increase in the BOD and whatever other contaminants, but you're spreading it out over a bigger area and so hopefully minimizing the impact. So this was, for instance, done in Boston Harbor where you know they specifically engineered it to go from what was turning out to be about a 14 to 1 dilution to about 100 to 1 and it improved water quality. The number of sort of algal blooms and so forth that were happening went down. Okay, so when we're talking about alpha water treatment, these are just some of the processes that go on. These are what, you know, what a bar screen <clears throat> process uh, part of the facility looks like and what grit removal looks like. And this is for the macroscopic particles, obviously, sand particulate, sand size for this stuff. This is for um, any, you know, larger things that could get into wastewater. You have to remember that wastewater in a city is not just, um, you know, whatever stuff that uh, goes down the toilet or the drains in your house. There are other sources of water, uh, oftentimes storm drains and gutters. That water gets in there too. So there's, you know, large objects that can be in the water. Those are removed first. <clears throat> then um, next is solids removal. And all the solids I mentioned before that are removed from wastewater called sludge. And the primary treatment um, of wastewater basically takes the water and removes the solids and um, the secondary treatment removes the BOD. And a lot of the way BOD is removed is through biological process, through biological decomposition of organic matter that helps reduce the BOD. And that process makes cellular tissue and that cellular tissue contributes to the solids. So while the water might be getting clearer of BOD, it's not like you, um, you know, we're not converting all the carbon into CO2 and all the nitrogen into N2 and just having them bubble off into the atmosphere. A lot of it is um, incorporated into biomass of one type or another. And that biomass um, forms organic matter that is synthesized, if you will, it's produced in bioreactors that adds to the solids. And so the amount of organic matter in the sludge actually goes up as we try to reduce the BOD 
that uh, is coming out in the water part of the wastewater that's being removed. So you can see here, this is kind of a standard, typical, if you will, sort of process for removal of uh, organic matter. And something like um, maybe 40%, a little bit less than half, is you know converted by respiration into CO2 and um, bubbled off into the atmosphere. And the rest, especially the nitrogen and phosphorus, whatever trace elements are in there, goes into some kind of biomass. And that's that's more than half. And that gets added to the sludge. So obviously the sludge is increasing in concentration of organic matter. That can't be released into the environment. This is just um, what sludge looks like. So this is active um, decomposition of um, or reduction of BOD by incorporation into these solids. And this is done in aerobic conditions. And so there's you know a variety of um, phenomena that can take place. There can be the promotion of, of growth of algal biomass. There can be the promotion of um, aerobic or spiring organisms that are produced. And then at some point, once uh, you know the, the water is to an acceptable level, it's skimmed off and goes on to other parts of the treatment process. And then the sludge is usually kind of dewatered dehydrated and um, you know either disposed of on site or um, oftentimes sent away. I mean, large municipalities make way more sludge than they have places to put their sludge. And so oftentimes it gets loaded on ships and sold to other countries and stuff. It's not, I mean, even though it's very rich in organic matter, you might think it would be great as a fertilizer. It's not because of all the other chemicals and pathogens that are in there. And this is a list of some of the stuff that is found in the sludge component of wastewater treatment. So that the water coming out doesn't have these things in it, but the sludge solids do. So all these different organic compounds, you can see PCB, DT, this breakdown of DDT, DDT, dieldrin, aldrin, phenols, um, heavy metals, cadmium, lead, mercury, chromium, et cetera, really high concentration. Pathogenic microorganisms um, can be present depending on how the sludge has been treated with you know, all sorts of things. And so there are places, including in Mexico, where sewage sludge is used as a fertilizer. Um, and while you know it may make plants look like they're growing pretty well, they're exposing them to all these kinds of things. So it's, it's usually not um, considered um, a good practice to reuse sludge. It, it actually, depending on the concentrations and, and of some of the pathogens, can be you know considered toxic waste. So, <clears throat> just thought I would spend a little bit of time now talking about some of the things that happen during solids removal and um, flocculation. And so, um, depending on what contaminants are in the wastewater, if they if there's relatively high levels of something, then um, these are a couple of the flocculants that can be added to the water to help pull out certain components. So this is, you know, aluminum sulfate or alum and uh, ferric iron sulfate. Um, these are two things that can be added. What happens is, is that they create the hydroxide. And this is just an example showing you that um, aluminum is most insoluble between pH 6 and 8 you know, where you make aluminum hydroxide, when you make the aluminum hydroxide particulates, um, which basically has the Gibbs site structure, then stuff can stick onto that and be flocculated and removed out. So if the water is more acidic or more basic, you know, we'll make these solids. Uh, and so you need to have a kind of a specific pH. Uh, iron sulfate also has a similar behavior, although it's more soluble at high pH, or excuse me, more soluble at low pH and less soluble at high pH. So it has a slightly different profile than this. Um, and, you know, the choice of one versus the other depends a little bit on what you're trying to remove and how much iron there was originally in the water. You don't want to add too much iron. The aluminum is usually pretty, pretty insoluble, but the iron can be soluble. This is an example of adding aluminum sulfate and removing viruses from the water. So this is the amount of aluminum that's being added. And this is the percent of viruses being removed. And this is the um, 
growth of turbidity in the water, right? So as you start adding more and more aluminum sulfate, the water reaches a maximum turbidity, you kind of reach the solubility maximum of the aluminum, and the rest of it goes into particulates. And you can see that for some bacteria, you can remove up for significant percent, about 50%. For this bacteria, you don't remove as much. But uh, fit, depending on which bacteria are in the water, this can be a pretty effective way of pulling things out. This is just how uh, virus removal varies as a function of pH. And you can see here that, you know, if pH is more like five or six is better than it is at pH nine, which, you know, makes sense when we go back oops, and to this diagram, you can see up here at pH nine, we're making a lot less of, of a particle. So the water needs to be monitored for its pH. And this is just um, showing you the effectiveness of, of this particular T4 how much of that uh, is can be removed. So you can get up to conditions where, you know, almost 100% is removed. <clears throat> Other ways to remove viruses from the water include just putting the water out in ponds and letting it be exposed to oxygen and sunlight. And you can see here the sort of amount of oxygen, or excuse me, the amount of virus that's removed relative to the amount of time. And, you know, it's, it's highly variable, but if water, uh, if you have the space and you're not worried about kind of winds whipping up virus laden water and exposing it to people, so this sort of needs to be out in the countryside um, or at least isolated from where people are, uh, you can get you can get viruses to decrease in concentration pretty substantially. Um, this is uh, some other kind of occurrences of viruses and viral load into the environment from wastewater treatment, showing you all the various ways that viruses can get back into the environment. Um, this <clears throat> purple box being sort of the primary effluence from wastewater treatment. Um, the, here's the effluent and the sludge that we just talked about. So this is happening at wastewater treatment plants. And that is one of several ways in which viruses to get in the environment. Another primary way is through um, septic systems. And this was, you know, like one of the things that was monitored during the peak of the pandemic was the amount of COVID virus in the water, you know, to, to get some idea of how the pandemic was progressing. <clears throat> that stuff just passes straight through those systems into the environment, um, as well as, you know, the application of manure in the agricultural uh, settings. <clears throat> Not all these viruses are dangerous, obviously, but um, so collectively, all these viruses get some of them, you know, stick on the soil and sediment particles, some of them are in the water. And so this is collectively, you know, you know all of the sources of viruses. So that even though, you know, we want to mitigate this and we can mitigate this, it doesn't mean that, that viruses aren't getting into the environment. So from the perspective of removing BOD, BOD, especially particularly the organic carbon component of BOD, is removed by the kind of combination of the solids and removal, flocculation, filtration, et cetera, and degradation. And DOC reduction is by biological degradation. And this is just kind of like, for instance, what an effluent might look like, what it looks like after physical settling. So that's just primary treatment and, and what the sludge is removed from this looks like. Secondary treatment. And then, you know, what the water, what the effluent looks like. It still has plenty of organic matter, and I wouldn't drink it, um, even just from the perspective of the organic matter. You can see it's still got a color and so forth, but it gets it down to this sort of, you know, 20 milligrams per liter threshold uh, as required for release. Um, that's not reuse water, but that's water that can be released into the environment. This slide just kind of summarizes what happens in the sludge treatment. So sludge treatment is basically done in these bioreactors that allow, in the presence of oxygen, some amount of decomposition of organic matter. So you've got aerobic respiration as well as algal biomass production happening, <clears throat> producing some CO2, incorporating some of the carbon into new biomass, um, a sedimentation basin that's removing that. Some of it is returned into the system as sort of like a, um, a recycling because you get the right sort of population mix to effectively treat whatever particular solids you have. You're always making more solids. So some of it is going off in excess. 
but this is a typical um, kind of, you know, one single stage, uh, what we call activated sludge reactor treatment. This can happen in a more complicated system where you can even have aerobic and anaerobic components of the reactor. And here again, you've got um, physical separation and flocculation, but the bioreactor in this case is operating pretty much just like that one up above it. There's other ways too that you can on site separate, like if you have relatively low flow, um, if you're an individual house, instead of having a septic system, you could use something like this, where essentially the water um, is physically filtered, right? It's screened, and then that screen water goes into a storage tank, and then that is basically slowly released into a field with plants that are um, able to incorporate the organic carbon and you're basically relying on the soil for the carbon breakdown process and the incorporation of most of the sort of organic contaminants and heavy metals into the plants as we've talked about before when we talked about phytoremediation some species of plants can incorporate a fair amount of this and then the kind of release of the water storage um, aeration and then um, release and so he has this basically takes care of the same thing as the activated sludge process, but in a way that instead of producing sludge, you're producing plants that um, might have you know, relatively high concentration of contaminants that need to be removed. Um, so I just thought I would also mention that once you've gone through all these processes, if there's still some dissolved organic carbon, especially stuff that isn't particularly reactive from a biological perspective, then it can be cleaned out um, by sorption on a granulated activated charcoal. That's a pretty common way of removing low molecular weight hydrocarbons, halo carbons, things that are not really biologically activated on. There are also synthetic resins that can be used uh, if you have a specific compounds that really don't stick very well to activated charcoal. Um, and there are even more complicated things that can be done if the carbon compounds are present and they're hard to remove by these processes, such as oxidizing the water if you need to. Um, and so um, I think, I don't know, I'm trying to remember what, what the point of this slide was. So, in, I mean, I guess the point of this one was that in addition to the um, dissolved organic carbon, as, you're, as this stuff is being broken down in sludge reactors and whatever, you're also increasing the nitrogen and phosphorus, the free nitrogen and phosphorus in the water, which if released into the environment could cause fertilization. So this nitrogen and phosphorus, if it's being liberated in the water, needs to be pulled out before the water is incorporated into the environment. That's usually done by sort of red field ratio algal biomass production. So I have a, a slide for kind of showing what that looks like. These are just um, some more um, kind of solids removals, how, how, it, how it can be done. Um, reduction of solids by incorporating them into soils and allowing them to break down, for instance. Um, there's a few more slides about the, the sort of way nitrogen and phosphorus can be removed, which link back to sort of what their chemistry is. But we know that phosphorus doesn't really have any gaseous forms, but it likes to incorporate into particulates, organic solids and inorganic particulates. Nitrogen can be converted by denitrification into N2, which is the ideal uh, scenario, um, or other forms which can be then incorporated into the algal biomass, nitrate, ammonium, et cetera. Um, this slide just sort of shows that um, you can remove phosphorus if you have excess phosphorus, a lot of it is in the phosphate form by precipitating it out, making a calcium phosphate, for instance, or a zinc phosphate or aluminum phosphate. These are all sort of pH dependent. They all require relatively high pHs. So um, if, if there's excess phosphorus and it can't be incorporated into algal biomass, then you have to raise the pH in the water and then lower it back down before you release it. But this can pull out phosphorus and this process also pulls, can pull some other heavy metals out. And these are just some of the uh, forms of uh, phosphorus removal compounds. Um, and this kind of shows you that if you if you want to remove phosphorus and um, money is no expense, that if you add lanthanum, small amount of lanthanum, lanthanum is one of the rare elements. Uh, oh well, it's up here, but it's the first first rare element. Um, 
that depending on the conditions and depending on what kind of phosphorus is in there, you can remove. So these are the large scale, substantially more by adding in lanthanum, but it's it's pretty costly. So it would pretty much only be done when there's really um, you know, significant contaminants uh, that, that can't be removed in other ways. This is sort of, you know, a, a reactor scenario for phosphorus removal and recovery from domestic wastewater in a um, kind of flow through reactor tank, which induces crystallization. PRC is phosphorus removal by crystallization, where you're basically adding, you know, taking your wastewater um, um, and allowing it to come into one of these reactors and crystallizing out the particulates and um, coupling that with sort of um, typical uh, sludge removal. So for nitrogen, basically, you're trying to either remove an nitrogen as ammonium ions or nitrogen as N2 gas. Those are the two easiest ways to remove it. This is a table from your text kind of explaining the different ways. We've already talked about chlorination, how, how that can help react away some of the nitrogen. But you know the most efficient way is air stripping. Again, you can air strip ammonium, but ammonia, but you have to be at relatively high pH. Uh, so as you can see, the pH of 11. So that would mean raising the pH up a lot and then lowering it back down, which is something that um, ideally you would not do, um, just from a cost perspective. So biosynthesis and nitrification, denitrification are the two common things for incorporation in the sludge, algal biomass, or um, denitrification to make N2. And this is that, that slide I referred to before. It shows you sort of what happens with the ratio of typical sludge with the carbon nitrogen phosphorus ratio, what happens in the activated sludge process, how much of that gets, this is the solids that get pulled out, this is the water that gets pulled out, and this water has enough free nitrogen phosphorus in it that it's too high to be released in the environment in most cases. And so it goes into um, a setting, it can be a shallow pond or it can be uh, in surface soils where you promote the production of photosynthetic material. If it's in water, it's algal. And um, so, you know, where you're basically incorporating the nitrogen and phosphorus so that the effluent that comes out of that, while it still may have a little bit of carbon, Carbon is in a form that you know can't be incorporated into uh, biomass. The nitrogen and phosphorus are effectively reduced down to zero. It's a lot of extra effort, and as you can imagine, you need to be monitoring the composition that's coming out to make sure that you know, for instance, the nitrogen to phosphorus ratio changes a lot. Then, um, because we're relying on the Redfield ratio of uh, 15 to 1, 16 to 1 for um, nitrogen to phosphorus. And we could have excess phosphorus or nitrogen coming out of the system. So it needs to be monitored. But there, there are ways of cleaning out the <coughs> constituents. But again, as I started emphasizing before, even though we've reduced the BOD, we've reduced the nitrogen or the phosphorus, something like this doesn't guarantee that you've reduced you know, other kinds of compounds, heavy metals, organics, personal care products, for instance, at the outflow of this process. So how, this is just for release of water back in the environment in a place where it won't cause eutrophication. I think that was, yep, that's the last slide. So I know it's kind of a whirlwind of wastewater treatment, but um, are there questions about wastewater? No? Okay.